So we're going to look at all the trig functions now. And we're going to really use intuition. So we'll start with cosine. All right, so here's a graph of cosine without going into too many details. It's also a graph of sine if you shift it a little bit. So either way, there's a sine of cosine graph. I'm not going to draw the uh, y-axis or the x-axis. Then I'd have to draw two graphs to say one was cosine and one was sine. What do you think about continuity from what you know about the graph, or continuity and what the graph look, looks like? It's going to be continuous, right? You pick any point you want on that graph, you go one side, you're going to approach it, the other side you approach it also. Whether it's at the top, at the bottom, exactly between, any point you pick, you're going to approach same point, both sides. So that's what I say about you. We're just going to use intuition here and say, look, it's continuous. Now, if you wanted to get very rigorous about it, like we did with the other functions, you're going to have to go through with the definition of you have to go with the definition of a limit to say why the limit matches the value, which we're not going to go through that level of detail. But you know, you just keep zooming in, and as far as I can zoom in here, but it'll look continuous, and it is continuous. So it's cosine, uh, sine. They look just like that. What about tangent and cotangent? Their gra graphs look exactly the same, except their no, one of them is a reflected and shifted version. So tangent is looks like this, and you get a vertical asymptote, and another one of those, a vertical asymptote, another one of those, vertical asymptote, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you need to close the the window, if the light gets in your eyes, it's the white one on the right side. Uh, so it's definitely not continuous everywhere, right? There's vertical asymptotes. So a function doesn't even have a value at those vertical asymptotes. Let's look between the vertical asymptotes. What can we say between the vertical asymptotes? It looks good. Any point I pick on the actual graph itself, even a point way up near the top, of course you can't actually get to the top because you can go up as high as you want. You'll just get closer and closer to that vertical asymptote. So any point in the domain, it's going to be continuous. So what's missing in the domain, it's all these vertical asymptotes. So tangent and cotangent are continuous on their domains, meaning where you've got your vertical asymptotes, you're not going to be continuous there. So cosine and sine are continuous on their domain. That's for cosine and sine. Tan and cot so cotangent looks almost the same except your I'll just do one period of cotangent. One period of cotangent looks like this. It just goes sort of downwards instead of upwards. But really similar. So there's cotangent. Tangent and cotangent are continuous on their domains. So the only functions left are secant and cosecant. And they, they do have the exact same graph if you just shift it. So I don't have to spend geez, much time graphing these out. Secant and cosecant, they do have vertical asymptotes. Their period is twice as long as the tangent cotangent period. So these functions are just a whole bunch of, they're not exactly parabolas, but they are sort of U-shaped. They're similar shaped to parabolas. So secant and cosecant are continuous on their domains. So as long as you're not at vertical asymptote, you're, you have a nice continuous function.
So we can summarize all this and just say all trig functions are continuous on their domains. You just have to know what the domains are. So that's more of a pre-calculus thing to worry about. So I'm assuming you know what their domains are. So I'm just going to say all trig functions are continuous on their domains. Now their domains are all open intervals, so you don't have to worry about left and right continuous. Cosine and sine, their domain is negative infinity, positive infinity. That's the nicest open interval you can have, everything. Tangent, cotangent, depending on which one you're dealing with, their tangent domain, I think that's negative pi over two to pi over two, and then pi over two to three pi over two, et cetera, et cetera. So on tangent and cotangent, and secant and cosecant, their domains are intervals of open, uh, unions of open intervals. So if we just wrote domain for tangent, pi over 2, oh, yeah, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, union dot dot dot, and also I can go the other direction with all the negative ones as well. So infinite open intervals both directions, so that's for tangent. And you get something really similar for cotangent, secant, and cosecant. You just look at the graphs and see what x values you got to remove. So either way, all trig functions are continuous on their domains. We'll do one more limit before we leave this section. So cosecant and tangent are individually continuous on their domains. That means their product is continuous. Products are continuous or continuous. The only question is, is zero in the domain of cosecant and cotangent. Go oh, cosecant and regular tangent, sorry. So these will be equal if zero is in the domain of both of those functions. Otherwise we may have to work a little harder. All right, easy question, what's tangent zero? Zero. Cotangent zero, that's, uh, or cosecant zero is a little more tricky. I'll write it as one over sine of zero. What is sine of zero? Oh no, sine of zero is zero. Zero is the So one over zero times zero is zero over zero, which means we have to do a little more work. So we can't go that direction because of cosecant. Tangent was fine, but cosecant has a problem. So it's all because of our cosecant function. So it's not continuous at x equals zero. We'd be dividing by zero. All right, so what do you do when you get zero over zero? So when you're doing all your web work questions, you got zero over zero. Usually went and used algebra. So there was multiply by conjugate over conjugate, factor, cancel. Maybe expand and then factor and cancel. Or expand, combine like terms, cancel out. That's not really going to work here. There's really nothing to factor. So what can I do with trig functions? We haven't done many limits with trig functions before. What did you do way back when you did trig identities? There's, I think, four strategies or five strategies you used. So what can we do with tangent and cosecant? 
So let's write with sines and cosines. Maybe we'll get lucky and things will cancel out nicely. So cosine is 1 over sine. So let's partition all that junk off. That's not really going to help us. So we got 1 over sine. Tangent is sine over cosine. So I'm going to cancel the sine x's right here. They cancel out as long as they're not 0. What x value makes sine 0? I'll give you a hint. It's on the board. 0. zero. Now, x approaches 0, but that also means it's getting close to 0, but not. I don't care what happens when x equals 0. As far as the limit's concerned, I want to know what happens when x is close to 0. So I don't care about x equaling 0 right here. If I asked you about continuity, different story. But I just asked you about limit in this question. So this function is definitely not going to be continuous. It's not defined. Uh, but we're only looking at the limit right now. So that cancels out. And so this is 1 over cos x. Well, this is really good because cosine is not going to be 0. So last step, cosine is nice and continuous. And cos 0 is 1. So we get 1 as our final limit value. Jeez. My computer is crazy today. So that's our last uh, topic in 2.5. Now we're going to jump into 2.6. So I made you do adjust homework dates. I'll definitely look at web work after the class. So we're going to look 2.6 is limits involving infinity and asymptotes of graphs. That's the longest title of any in the book. So we haven't really done many limits involving infinity. There are some in 2.2 that if you worked extra hard, you probably figured out. Or if you didn't work extra hard, you'll go back and finish them when, we, uh, when I finish lecturing. So I'll make sure I extend 2.2. There are some that have infinity in them. So you've been thinking about real numbers, either with the symbol R, capital R, or the words real numbers, or the open interval negative infinity to positive infinity. So you've been dealing with these sets of numbers for a long time. Anytime you draw a graph, even if you don't have a full domain, probably at least one of the sides is going towards negative infinity or positive infinity. So let's talk about infinity for a minute. So we'll look a lot closer at infinity in Calc 2, but we're going to look a little bit. Uh, we're going to look at infinity a little bit right now. So here is a real number line. Real number line obviously has numbers in it. Is there a biggest number? So if you talk to a small child who doesn't know much about math, they'll tell you, oh, I know the biggest number. And all you have to do, so if I said the biggest number is 10 trillion, how can you prove me wrong? 10 trillion and 1. Yeah, just add 1 to it and say, no, you're wrong. My number's bigger. So you kind of have the biggest number. You just take whatever number somebody says and just add any positive number to it, and you got a bigger number. You could double it if you want to, you know, really show them they're wrong. I mean, you're wrong either way. But there is no number that's the biggest. So how do we think of infinity and negative infinity? 
So infinity is the thing that is past all the numbers. So whatever your number you're thinking of, we can certainly make a bigger number. But no matter what number you think of, infinity is the thing that's past all those numbers. So it's, you don't necessarily want to think of the end of the number line, but it's basically the end of the number line. <laughs> um, so, all right, so the problem with the human mind is that everything is basically finite. So somebody says, I love you forever. What do they mean? Do they mean infinity? No. No, maybe 80 years if it's a good run. <laughs> is that an infinite number of years? No. Definitely not. I mean, in our lifetime it seems like it, but we don't have a very good concept of infinity. And so when we say infinity, generally we don't mean it. Or something like forever. So forever probably means somewhere closer to 80 years or less. Sometimes eight weeks or something like that. So we do not have a very good concept of infinities at all, positive infinity or negative infinity. So you want to think about infinity is basically a direction. So if I say positive infinity, it's that way. If I say negative infinity, think of it as like that way. But no matter how far you go that way, you're never going to get, it's like the end of the rainbow. Right? It's an optical illusion. It will keep moving as you go towards it. Or it will disappear when there's no more humidity or whatever in the air that makes rainbows. So infinity and negative infinity are sort of like uh, directions. They're not numbers. So what we're about to do is take limits as x approaches infinity or negative infinity. And some of our limits will have answers that are infinity or negative infinity. And you want to think about them as well, if I kept going that way forever, what would I be getting close to? I would never hit it, but what would I be getting close to? Well, it depends on, on the function, but we'll see. We'll start out with an easy function. It's a very good question. So because you asked, <laughs> So here's a number line. I'll draw a y-axis right here. And I'm going to draw a, it's not going to be a unit circle. It'll be a diameter one circle. I'm going to draw it at the top right there. And I'm going to cut out the point at the very top right there. Actually, I'm going to use the real drawing tools in this thing because I want to be a little bit more precise. Where are my shapes? Shapes. And my circle. I'll do my best to make it a circle. Come on. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is very entertaining. Good. Sorry, I've only really used the pen on this thing. And oh. <laughs> I want to move my good circle to where my Bad. lazy circle is. Click on the lazy circle. But I have to I'm on selecting text though. You broke infinity. Oh man. Delete it. I can undo so twice. Yeah. Maybe I'll draw my circle off to the side. Yeah. 
and then drag it. Maybe that'll work. <coughs> That's okay. Wasting time is fun. <laughs> I've never done it before. It's my first time. There you go. <laughs> yes. oh. All right. Perfect. We've learned a new skill. Yay. All right. I'm going to hand draw the rest. I'll do it all in. I'm going to mark red at the top. So I'm going to remove that point out of the circle. And I want to make a line now. I'll do all my drawing in blue. All right, I want one without magnets on it. So I'm going to do my best, oh come on, to draw. No. I had a pen. I do have a pen. Oh. Where are cyborgs when you need them? <laughs> Alright, I did my best to draw a straight line. I don't want to go to use a line tool. All right, so think about the two places this intersects. Forget the red place where it intersects. That's where it's going to originate from. So I'll call this point, I'll call this one x, and I'll call this one right here x with the bar on top. So I think, hopefully I convinced you that whatever value you pick on the real number line, there's exactly one place on the circle that that blue line will cut through. So you pick any other point on the x-axis, and I'll pass through one point on the unit circle getting there. I'll, draw, I'll try to draw another one. I don't know if I'll get that one was really nice that I just drew. All right, good enough. So you pick anywhere on the x-axis, and there'll be one point on the circle that you also hit with that line, right? So this correspondence takes every real number and places it onto that circle that I drew. What about 10 trillion? Well, where's 10 trillion going to be? Obviously, it's really far to the right. And let's just say 10 trillion on this circle is going to be about right there. What about a trillion trillions? Closer. That's going to be even closer. We'll say exactly right there. Build what about in trillion, down. trillion, trillions? Even closer. So what do you think about the red dot being infinity? Correct. Okay. So you're never going to get there. So what if you take the limit of this idea, you keep going to the right forever, Where? what are you approaching on the unit circle, that red point at the very top? One. What's that? One, right? Well, if you're talking about y values, whatever, yeah, it could be y value 1. But you don't really want to use y values because then I would have the same y value for positive and negative. x value Right here. Zero. So you want to be a little careful with that because you want to repeat your y values. Uh, maybe if we measured in more of like an angle measurement, like we'll say zeros at the bottom, positive angles go counterclockwise and negative angles go clockwise. And then in that case, positive, let's say if I, I'll call positive 1 the top, and negative 1 will also be the top going the other way. So this is called the compactification of the real line. So I don't think I can spend any more time talking about infinity, but that'll give you enough. If that interests you, you might be a math major, and you can certainly get started on a Google search right there. So this is one way to think about infinity. So actually, positive and negative infinity in this case are identified as the same thing.
they're the top of the circle. That you'll never reach. Ever. So well, so what happens in the circle is that how far apart are those two points that I drew, the two small blue points there? They look really close, but one of them is a trillion and the next one's a trillion trillions. So even though they're like three pixels apart, they're really far apart. So what happens is distances up there are huge, even though they look small. Now if you think of uh, two close x values right here, where do they look on the unit circle? They're going to be pretty much just as close, even though they're not very far apart in the actual real number line. So what happens is distance gets messed up. So this, this tiny distance, this little bit of distance down here, is very different than what looks like the same distance right there. So that's where things get warped. So as you get the further up you go on the circle, the larger distances actually get, even though they may appear to be small. And that's the hard part to wrap your head around. And so how far is it from any point to the red point? Infinity. No matter how close you get, no matter how far up you go in the circle, you're infinitely far away from the red point, infinity at the top. So in one sense, the circle is very misleading because we look at it and say, oh, look, those points are super close. But if our national debt went from 20 trillion to a trillion trillions, I don't think anybody would say that that's very close. That would be a massive change. So what you're saying is one and two are just as far apart as a trillion and a trillion trillions. No, I'm saying one and two appear to be as far apart. Uh, using the metric that we, using the Euclidean metric, one and two appear to be the same distance apart as two huge numbers at the top of the circle, which means you can't use the Euclidean metric, the, the distance measurement that we're used to on the circle. There's a different way to measure distances. That gets, points get further and further apart distance-wise, even if they appear to be the same distance when you look at it. So that little distance that I measured, those are vastly, this one at the bottom might be one, and the one at the top might be, you know, some massive number. Which normally, if I, if I look at, you know, these two points, and then say, oh, look, they're that far apart and that far apart, no matter where I am in the unit, on, on the line, that distance is the same. So that's, that's why the line has a really nice property, that, you know, whatever that measurement is, half a centimeter means the same distance, no matter where I measure it. Yeah, and if you're a physics geek, you might think of something like a black hole that, you know, war starts warping time as you get close to it. Um, and bend space-time, and so things that might appear close or things that appear to happen at a normal speed are actually happening very slowly or quickly or however it goes. Uh, so that's where things get very strange. Uh, you can write the uh, equation for how, d how do you relate x bar and x. You can write out that equation very carefully. So it's not hard to write that out. Not easy, but it's not terribly hard to do so. You've got a circle, you've got an equation of a circle, this one's not centered at zero, so you have to work a tiny bit harder. But you can write the equation of the circle, the equation of you know, a point on the circle, the point down here, and relate them with a line. So you can relate these without anything beyond just algebra. But understanding what that relationship means is a different story. All right, so let's graph something easy. <laughs> What is a very important property of this function you need to graph it correctly? Asymptotes. Vertical asymptote. So what is our vertical asymptote? X equals zero. So that's the one x value is not in the domain. Every other x value is in the domain. All right, test your graphing skills. Go ahead and try to graph this. You could always 
go clueless method. You can plug in some x values like uh, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Asymptote. Vertical asymptote, if I spelled it all out. So if you don't remember what it looks like, maybe your neighbor remembers what it looks like. If they don't remember, you probably need a new neighbor. Maybe their neighbor knows. So this should be your graph right here. You got the point one, one, and negative one, negative one, and the bigger your x gets, the smaller your y gets. Now, we know the pattern that how the y gets smaller, it doesn't get smaller going more and more negative, it goes closer and closer to zero. So we actually get a horizontal asymptote also, right here. So a horizontal asymptote, y equals zero. And that's going to be our horizontal asymptote. In my pre-calculus class, I graphed little Mario clouds. And we did this right here. We'd write out y equals 0. So some stuff's happening in the middle. And what happens when x is really big, positive, really big, negative, y gets very close to 0 on those two ends right there. So now we're going to look a little more closely at this. So what x values do you think it's interesting to look at for limits? Infinity and so infinity and negative infinity. There is another x value that's interesting. Zero. Zero. All the other x values are pretty boring. You can look at the forward and say, ah, it's going to be continuous. Like if I ask you x approaches 1, well, it's going to be right about there. That's pretty boring. It's going to be continuous. It's going to approach. Same thing on both sides. You're approaching y equals infinity. You could say that. As, as x approaches 0, f of x approaches infinity is what we're going to write. Or negative infinity. depends on what side you're approaching now. I guess what I'm saying is, is could you look at it, I guess, backwards through the functions to look at the result of y equals So this function, this is x. I've written as x is a, uh, y is a function of x, y equals f of x. You could also. Multiply by x, divide by y. You could write it uh, y is a function, or x is a function of y if you wanted to. So this particular function passes the horizontal line test, so it's also, you could find the inverse function. Or write uh, y is, x is a function of y. So with this one, you could do that. So let's not worry so much about that. So we're going to look at some limits here. Let's start at x approaches 0 on both sides. We'll go 0 from the negative side first. So we're approaching 0 from the negative side. That means that direction. So we're approaching the 0 from the negative side. What is y? What is our y value approaching? So y is getting more and more negative. So we can say negative infinity. 
So as x approaches 0 on the left, then y is approaching negative infinity. So any questions looking at the graph compared to when we write out lim? So now, the tricky part is, let's say you didn't know what the graph looked like. How could we arrive at negative infinity? That's more tricky. So let's pretend that graph is not there. So x is approaching 0 from the negative side. So I can write that means x is less than 0. If x is less than 0, so x is negative, what does that say about 1 over x, positive or negative? So what's 1 divided by a negative number? Negative. negative. So 1 over x is negative, and 1 over x is getting bigger. So I could write, I want to be specific. What's that? If x is less than? It's getting more negative, a bigger negative. Oh, OK. So bigger means, yeah. If I say it's getting smaller, we're going to think it's getting towards 0. At least that's what I think about. All right. A larger magnitude negative number. So we think of this as 1 over 0 from the negative side. So it's 1 over a negative 0, which will be negative infinity. So it's always negative. So it's going to be negative infinity. So 1 over 0 from the negative side is negative infinity right there. So this came from the fact that 1 over x was negative. It's going to get bigger and bigger, but because it's negative, it gets bigger and bigger negative value. So that'll be negative infinity. So you can do these without a graph if you're careful about is it positive, is it negative. Is it easier to just graph it? It can be. Depends on your, it depends on the function really. Like this function, you probably graph this. This came from our library of functions in pre Cal 1, and if you got those, uh, you know, at the tip of your pen, basically, if you can just graph it out, go for it. Uh, if not, or if the function is more complicated, it might be faster to look at more algebraically. So let's write warning. This is not zero over zero is very different. So how is it different? If there's zero in the numerator. This could be anything. All right, so 0 over 0 is a lot more dangerous. Usually what you're going to do for the problems I give you is you're going to do algebra and hopefully knock out. Theoretically, you're going to knock out the 0 in the denominator. S most of the time, that cancels the 0 in the numerator also. So if you've got 0 over 0, in this class, you have to do algebra and cancel. Is it possible to knock it out without using algebra? Yes. called L'Hopital's rule, and you learn it in Calc 2. Okay. But you cannot use, there's no L'Hopital's rule in Calc 1, so don't use it. So if somebody tells you in the tutor center or somebody's helping you, just use L'Hopital's rule, that's voodoo magic, and you're not allowed to use it for uh, questions in this class. I want to see your algebra skills. I don't want to see you use L'Hopital's rule. There'll be plenty of times to use L'Hopital's rule later. You'll use it quite a bit in Calculus 2 but you're not going to use it in Calculus 1. Now, if you use it behind my back in your homework question, that's fine, but I'm not going to give you credit for it if you show that to me on a uh, quiz or a midterm. So if you say, ah, because L'Hopital's rule, you can check your work, but that better not be your actual work. So you can use it to check, yeah, but not to, the work I'm going to grade, I will not grade your L'Hopital's work. because it requires derivatives that I haven't even defined yet. All right, so 0 over 0 is very different. 
So let's go limit x approach to zero on the other side now. Well, x approach to zero from the positive side, that means x is greater than zero. So x is positive specifically. So I could write it as one over zero, but this time it's one over a small positive number. So this is gonna be positive, huge number. So here we had a positive number right there. So we're gonna get positive infinity. So we got left limit, we have right limit. What about regular limit? So put these together, lim x approaches zero either side. What can I conclude about this limit? Doesn't exist, why is that? Because they're two different, I wanna say numbers, but let's say two different values. That's a good word. So they're not two different numbers, but they're two different things or two different values. So they're, they aren't, they're not the same, it doesn't match. Because one side of limits do not match. So there are two more limits that are worth looking at in this example. And I think they were stated before, one of them x approaches all the way to the right towards positive infinity, and the other one x approaches negative infinity. So we'll write those two out now. So you could write one over infinity. What does one over a big number What's one way to describe one over a really big number? It's a really small number. It's a really small number. So if I asked to borrow one trillionth of a dollar, you'd probably have to cut your penny up into really tiny pieces. That'd be a really tiny amount of money. I'd just give you the penny. You'd probably just round it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one over infinity, the limit of one over x, x approaches infinity, we'll write as just zero. It's a tiny number. Now negative infinity, one over x, you could write as one over negative infinity. This one turns out is also zero. One over a huge negative number. It is a tiny negative fraction, but the bigger your denominator gets, the closer you're gonna get to zero. What's the difference between the two? One of them approaches zero in the positive direction. Like when we look on the right side, we're approaching from above, zero from above. When we look on the negative side, we're approaching zero from below. But either way, you're getting close to y equals zero. So, is it possible to approach infinity from the left or the right side? Or is it over the right? Sure. I mean, any polynomial is going to approach positive or negative infinity if you look to either side. Well, but I mean, like, it's saying if x was approaching the side of the one. Yeah, so we'll look at if, if I did one over like absolute value of x or one over x squared, I could have both sides approaching infinity from like both sides of zero approaching infinity. So if they match, even if they're both infinity, you can say the limit's infinity. So it follows the same limit rule, left and right agree, hey, you have your limit. That's not, these two, you don't really wanna match those two up because those x values are uh, approaching very different directions. They're not both approaching the same thing. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay.